السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم Now I realize that you've been sitting for a while and I understand that refreshments are going to be uh, served uh, soon after my lecture. Uh, I can see some of you are thinking you need it now. <laughs> but uh, let's hope that uh, my talk itself will inshallah be refreshing with uh, a good uh, feedback of energy from you. If I see your faces smiling, if I see your eyes twinkling, I'll know that I'm saying something well worth listening to. Now some of you came out here today just uh, because you want to be better Muslims and in that case my talk to you might seem a little bit irrelevant. But to make my talk relevant I'd like to uh, just repeat for you something that uh, our brother Gary Miller put before us. He said that garbage removal is a very important task because you might have a very beautiful house but if the enemies come and they pile garbage in front of that house eventually nobody is going to be able to see how beautiful is your house. So somebody has got to remove the garbage. And it just so happens that in our present time, brothers and sisters, garbage removal is a full-time job. Because there's so much that is being piled up at the doorstep of Islam. Somebody's got to remove that garbage. Now I thought that uh, this piece of garbage was um, only in the Toronto area. But then, uh, I, I can see you're nodding already, you've seen it here. So Brother Tanmir said you've got to speak about this subject because this material is being distributed here in the UK. Alright, so what is this? Here is a little um, uh, comic book uh, type of um, presentation. It looks very interesting and the title of course uh, has got the green color on there so Muslims associate that with the dome of the Prophet's mosque, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Brother Faisal, I see you're wearing a lovely green. <laughs> and uh, it's got the moon and star that Muslims are very familiar with. And look at the title of that book, Allah had no son. So a Muslim finds this in the subway train riding in Toronto and thinks, oh, here is a nice piece of Muslim literature. Or if a Christian gives this to a Muslim, the Muslim thinks, oh, the Christians are now converting. <laughs> finally, finally they understand Allah had no son. But the title and the face of it is deceptive because when you go into the material, you realize that what it shows is that Muslims are worshipping a false god. That Allah is not God, so we can say that Allah had no son and still be Christians because Allah really is not God. This is what they're trying to say here. So who do they think Allah is? The comic book presentation shows that a Christian man speaks to somebody who looks like a mullah. He's like all his uh, get up and everything is uh, quite clearly so. And uh, this Christian eventually convinces the Muslim that what you are worshipping when you're making sujood is not the unseen creator of the heavens and the earth, the God of the Bible, the God of Isa alayhi salam, but you are worshipping a pagan God. You are worshipping what was the moon God that was worshipped in Arabia. And that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, in order to gain following for himself, he wanted to tell the people that what you're on is okay. So you know this God that you have, this moon God that you worship, you can continue worshipping him. Just uh, say that there is no God besides this one. And the people used to say that this one has daughters, Lat, Uzzah and Manat. You just say that he has no daughters. But the same moon God that you used to love to worship, you can continue doing that. Now because he is using some names, some bits of evidence, some information which is true, one gets the impression that obviously the writer knows what he's talking about. When he mentions Lat and Uzzah and Manat, when he mentions the daughters of Allah, and when he can refer to a certain passage of the Quran which actually makes reference to the people saying that Allah has daughters. So one thinks, yeah, these people are on the right track. They know how to write a book. As Gary Miller said, these people know how to write books. Because in the beginning, you will find uh, an introduction, you will find a preface, and then at the end, you will find uh, a bibliography. You will find an index page. And so you get the impression that these are really scholarly individuals putting before you information. Now, where does this information come from? 
For this little booklet, I see that there is a constant reference to a book written by a certain Dr. Robert Morey, a book entitled The Islamic Invasion. So I went and got his book to find out what is happening here. What is he saying in that book? Where is his evidence? And in fact, after he had written The Islamic Invasion, a couple of years later, that uh, scholar wrote this book, The Moon God Allah in the Archaeology of the Middle East. And this is where he puts forward his argument in a more concise and uh, in fact more persuasive manner. He gives archaeological evidence. Again, if you look at his book, you think that everything here you know, is well documented. He gives you pictures of archaeological discoveries of the ancient moon god. He gives you maps, drawings, illustrations. So one who reads this becomes convinced. Look at his footnotes. His footnotes are all well referenced pages of it. So one thinks that all of his material is sahih. But then, when I actually go through the material and I look at the books that he's quoting from to prove his case, I see that he's quoting from this book, Islam by Caesar Farah. I see that he's quoting from uh, Alfred Guillaume's Islam. So I go out and I buy the books myself. So I can check these quotations and see where these ideas are coming from. And when I check these books, I see that the man quotes one thing and the sources from which he quotes usually say the other thing. For example, he quotes from uh, Caesar Fira's book just one sentence. The sentence he quotes is this, there is no reason therefore to accept the idea that Allah passed to the Muslims from Christians and Jews. Now that's the sentence he quotes and that's the point he wants to prove. He wants to prove that the Allah that Muslims worship is not the God of the Bible. So what does he find? He finds a convenient quote right here which says there is no reason therefore to accept the idea that Allah passed to the Muslims from Christians and Jews. But that's not everything this author has said. If we take the entire paragraph which begins on the previous page it says, Allah, the paramount deity of pagan Arabia, was the target of worship in varying degrees of intensity from the southernmost tip of Arabia to the Mediterranean. To the Babylonians he was ill, God. To the Canaanites and later the Israelites he was El. It's very important. To the Israelites he was El. In other words, we're talking about the same God of the Bible. The South Arabians worshipped him as Ilah, and the Bedouins as Al-Ilah, the deity. With Muhammad he becomes Allah, God of the worlds, of all believers, the one and only who admits of no associates or consorts in the worship of him. Judaic and Christian concepts of God abetted the transformation of Allah from a pagan deity to the God of all monotheists. There is no reason therefore to accept the idea that Allah passed on, uh, passed to the Muslims from Christians and Jews. You see, when you read the whole passage, you get such an entirely different understanding than what this man is quoting, that it makes you wonder, is this man writing as a Christian? Or what is he writing as? Because the Christian friends that we have, that we live among, that we work with, that we go to school with, uh, show us a, a different approach towards their understanding of Islam or their willingness to learn about Islam. You must have found that from your own experience. People out there uh, are willing to learn if we will just give them the right message. A different approach is taken by this Christian author, John Gilchrist, in his book entitled Our Approach to, Our Approach to Islam, Charity or Militancy. Now I'd like to refer to a relevant section in his book where he deals with this whole question as to whether or not Allah of the Muslims is the same as the God of the Bible. And in a nutshell he says that although we have different understandings of him, really Muslims and Christians are speaking about the same God. I'd like to read for you some of his uh, writings firsthand. 
He writes on page 20, the Christian writers who endeavor to distinguish between the Allah of Islam and the God of the Bible invariably concentrate on what Allah is not. He is not the father of Jesus Christ. He is not triune. He has no son, etc. Rarely is there an evaluation of who Allah in Islam really is. It would seem to be logical, before we express ourselves in convenient denunciations, to inquire what the Quran actually teaches about Allah and how he is defined in that book. Firstly, it is quite apparent from the Quran that the name Allah did not originate with Muhammad. The pagan Arabs openly acknowledge that beyond their various deities and idols, there was one supreme being who was the ultimate source of all things. If you should ask them who created the heavens and the earth and subjected the sun and the moon, they would surely reply, Allah. Uh, Surah 29, verse number 61. When faced with disasters, they cry unto Allah. Surah 10, verse number 22. And they also swear their strongest oaths by Allah. Surah 16, verse number 38. Western scholars agree that the name has pre-Islamic origins and that it is almost certainly derived from the Syriac Christian Allah. You see, I, and I can go on and on just to show you that the information is there for one who wants to find that correct information. But uh, the author on whom this comic book depiction de uh, depended obviously is not there looking for the truth. He has found something that he feels he can use in a convincing manner to persuade Christians to do not listen to Muslims and what they have to say. Now there is a reason for this approach and John Gilchrist himself in the book I last referred to explains why he thinks that other Christian writers are not taking the approach that he has taken in trying to describe Islam as it is. Why is it that many Christian writers, not only the man whose garbage I'm trying to now remove, but other Christians as well, have tried to show that Allah is not the God of the Christians. That Muslims are talking about a different God, about a pagan God. Sometimes they try to depict that Muslims are worshipping a black stone and so on. The reason for this according to John Gale Christ is that these writers think that Islam is a threat from within. I want you to understand that point. In other words, if Hindus say that Christians are worshipping something incorrect or they don't believe right, nobody has to listen to them. But if Muslims say this, that message can have an impact. One key reason for that is that Islam has continued the faith in Isa a.s. Has continued the faith in the God of Isa a.s has continued the faith in Musa salam, and Ibrahim salam. so that when we speak about religion we're basically speaking about the same religion which Allah revealed to all of his prophets in other words we are pulling the carpet from under their feet it's not that they have one and we have another one it's just that we have come along and we have said that look what you guys thought you have you don't have because we have it so we have become a challenge from within and since they cannot answer our arguments, what they have decided to do now is to try and place us without. So we're not, uh, no longer within the same Abrahamic faith. We have not inherited the same traditions. We did not continue the same beliefs. And the way to do that is to start with the God that we worship. They think that if they can convince the Christian public that the God we worship is a different God, then every Christian should rather stay far away from us because, you know, that's the way of the shaitan. We've got to be clear, clear of that. That is what they want to accomplish uh, by this particular tactic. But, of course, we are now in an information age. Such a tactic is bound to backfire. Information will be checked. Qu quotes will be studied. References will be cross-referenced. And if one uses deception in order to promote what he thinks to be true, that is only going to fly back into his face to his own shame. And so after I have done some considerable study on this uh, man's claims, I composed my own little reply to, to his book. What was his book? 
the moon god Allah in the archaeology of the Middle East. So I compiled this little booklet entitled Robert Morey's Moon God Myth and Other Deceptive Attacks on Islam. And in this book I go through in detail looking at his citations one after another. Where he quotes from Caesar Fera, where he quotes from uh, uh, Alfred Guillaume, where he quotes from the Encyclopedia Britannica, where he pro quotes from Professor Carlton Kuhn. And I show one after another that what he quotes is one thing and what his sources say is really something very, very different. But he has a few points that he thinks he can uh, feed the average person with and if one doesn't check the scholarly work behind those few points, one would be persuaded. For example, he says to Christians, you can know that I'm telling the truth because go, you will see every mosque has a little uh, moon and star on top. See, these people really are into this moon thing. And moreover, they start their fast when they see the moon. <laughs> so with little things like this, it seems that he's presenting something convincing. Sometimes he'll refer to something which is an actual fact, but the, the uh, coloring he'll put on it is really a distortion. For example, he'll say, look, this name Allah, it was there before Islam. Look, even the Prophet's father's name was Abdullah. He was the slave of Allah. So Allah was a God that was there before Islam. It was in pagan Arabia. Therefore, this was a pagan God. You see the deception? And then he goes one step further and says, this was the moon God. Whereas in fact, we believe that Allah always existed, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed his religion to all of his prophets. Over time, his religion was distorted. The religion of Ibrahim salam, was distorted in Arabia so that people continued to recognize Allah but in addition to recognizing Allah, they believed that Allah had children, they believed that Allah had uh, associates. They worshipped other gods in order to get closer to Allah. They prayed to idols in order that these idols might be intercessors and intermediaries between them and Allah. But once one knows this entire picture, the deception is erased. But for one who doesn't know, you give something like this into the hands of a Christian, they think, yeah, I always thought that something was wrong with Islam, and uh, you know, this is what it is, really. Or, you know, you put this into the hand of a Christian again, and they read through it, and they see that towards the back, here is this Arab guy, you know, with the Arab traditional headgear, beard and everything, and he's weeping. Look at the tears falling down his, his eyes, because he finally found Jesus Christ, and now he says, I must tell my people about the moon god. And then the Christian guy says to him, it may cost you your life, and he says, it will be worth it, because I will be with my loving father in heaven for all eternity. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Bilal Phillips in his book uh, Usul al-Tafsir made a passing reference to, to my book on this uh, and he referred to it as a dev devastating reply uh, to, to Robert Morey. Uh, but uh, if uh, Brother Bilal's um, statement is colored by his own uh, friendship and, and the fact that we are um, of the same faith, I'd like to um, share with you some comments which uh, are offered by a Christian, uh, Gerald Parker who sent to me his dossier in which he has collected some uh, materials concerning this. And uh, in fact, in this dossier, he has uh, reproduced, he has reproduced my entire um, booklet, Robert Morey's uh, Moon God Myth and uh, Other Deceptive Attacks uh, on Islam. He's just photocopied it and he has uh, presented it to others after obtaining my permission. And I'd like to just uh, read for you some of what this man thinks about such types of attacks on Islam. Gerald Parker writes, Anyway, I am enclosing with this frustrating letter a copy of Shabir Ali's devastating booklet, Robert Morey's Moon God Myth and Other Deceptive Attacks on Islam. Shabir Ali runs the Canadian branch, and then he goes on further, and he says, um, Note Ali's cold but very civil tone. He does not need to indulge in Maury's brand of hysteria and character assassination to make his points, and his calm, lucid approach only heightens the effect of his very effective refutation of Maury's claims. Now, um, after knowing 
uh, actually he's writing this letter to the editor of a Christian magazine that has published materials from Robert Morey. So he writes, uh, now Pastor Otten, after knowing that uh, Shabir Ali um, and uh, the Muslim World League will counter Robert Morey every step of the way, not, not neglecting his abuse, and after reading Ali's booklet, can you, in good conscience, continue to print Maury's diatribes or distribute his shoddy materials? Maury is humiliating the cause of our Lord and Savior and Christians themselves. And Christians themselves must make efforts as strong as Muslims' own efforts to neutralize Maury. Maury demonizes his opponents, and it is never right to do that. We must speak the truth in love as the Bible urges us to do, not spew forth lies, exaggerations, distortions, and sheer spleen as Maury does. And then he continues to say, Maury constantly refers to his so-called heroic battles with Islam and with its proponents. In fact, uh, this man has debated both myself and Dr. Badawi on separate occasions. And if you ask the Muslims, the Muslims will say it was a clear victory for Islam. But if you ask the Robert Maury, he won every one of them all the way, 100%. <laughs> But he never mentioned, so far as I have noticed, whatever success his foul methods bring in actually converting Muslims. Why? Because he antagonizes them. Any Muslim knowing his faith realizes how utterly false Maury's arguments are. And that's from Gerald Parker, a fellow Christian of uh, Dr. Maury. But that's what he thinks of that whole approach and the way in which we have replied. Uh, to the uh, points which are made from that direction. So then finally, brothers and sisters, if you came out here to today in order to become better Muslims, you might find that this uh, whole presentation is a little bit uh, um, off the wall. I mean, it's not something that you actually came for. But if you listen to our brother Gary Miller, garbage removal really is a necessary task. You can have the most beautiful house, but if you allow the enemies to come and pile garbage in front of that house, nobody's going to be able to see how beautiful your house is. And that's the very point of piling the garbage in the first place. So Muslims have to remove that garbage. If that's the only thing we did in Dawah, we can at least say we have made some contribution. We did not allow people to go about spreading lies and attacking Allah and His Messenger and saying falsehood about the religion of truth. In fact, a hadith Qudsi says, ibn Adam wa lam The child of Adam has uh, denied me and had no right to do so. shatamani wa lam And has insulted me and had no right to do so. Muslims cannot sit around and stand by and allow the enemies of Allah to insult Allah. And yet this is what is being done. Other people are making efforts to spread their faith. Did you ever get a knock on your door one Sunday morning? Jehovah's Witnesses. Hear another knock two minutes later? Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We've got the Book of Mormon for you. You have them here? Yes? You see these young men, they are in the past for two years. Because they live by a philosophy that when they finish high school, they should go into that uh, missionary work for two years. And their parents fund that effort by putting forward 10,000 US dollars to look after their expenses while they're feasible tahut for two years. <laughs> and I want to ask you while you're in good spirits and laughing over this, how much are you going to give feasible so that Islam should be available in the literature? In the newspapers, it should be broadcast on radio, it should be shown on television, it should be there wide on the internet for the entire world to read and to view and to see. How much of your time, how much of your effort, how much of your professional skills, how much of your funds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with will you give in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that the garbage should be removed and so that the nur should be spread. قُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوكَ. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم